Good evening. Welcome to the May 4th meeting of the Penfield Board of Education. This meeting will be called back to order at 631. Please rise and the clerk will lead us in the pledge. to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. It is recommended that the board approve the May 4th, 2021 agenda as submitted. May I have a motion and a second that the agenda of May 4th, 2021 be approved as submitted. So moved. Second. Any questions or comments? All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion carries. And now we will be entering the annual budget hearing. So I'm going to read the notice of the annual budget hearing. Good evening. Ladies and gentlemen, as set by statute, it is now time for holding the 2021-2022 annual budget hearing of the Penfield Central School District. My name is Mark Elledge, and I am the president of the Penfield School D District Board of Education. The vote on the budget and for members of the Board of Education is in two weeks and is not at this meeting. The polls will be open on Tuesday, May 18th, 2021 in the high school gym from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. The district has continued to extended voting hours to make it more convenient for residents to vote. The notice of the annual meeting, budget vote and election has been duly published in accordance, according to law in the Daily Record, the Rochester Business Journal and the Penfield Post. Affidavits will be filed within the minutes of the meeting. It is customary, however, to read a summary of the notice, and the summary is as follows. Notice is hereby given that the annual vote and election will be held at the Penfield High School on Tuesday, May 18th, 2021, from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Daylight Savings Time. We are in qualified voters of the district may vote concerning the election of three members of the Board of Education, one budgetary proposition, one land purchase, purchase proposition and one bus purchase proposition and one proposition to establish a capital reserve fund. The election of three members to the Board of Education, Catherine Dean, Mark Elledge and William Yeager currently hold those seats. Candidates running to fill these seats in ballot order are Susan Kavanaugh, Catherine Dean, Kristen Harley, William Yeager, Mark Elledge, Nicole Feltz, Bandel Akini, Andreas Sillens, and Giselle Grooks. Proposition will be further detailed during the budget summary presentation. I have available the complete notice of the annual meeting, budget vote, and election as printed in the Daily Record, the Rochester Business Journal, and Penfield Post, and will be pleased to show it to anyone who wishes to see it tonight. With that, we will turn it over for the summary of the budget. Great, thank you. Uh, so this uh, 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 budget hearing, uh, I'll take a couple of slides and then I'll turn it over to Dr. Driffel, who will get into the details of the budget for the 2021-2022 school year. Uh, but we do like to point out um, sort of our, our overall philosophy around building a bright future. In Penfield schools, once again, all four of our elementary schools are ranked in the top 18 out of 162 schools in the Rochester area in, in 2020 based on four years of test scores. Bay Trails ranked number three out of 99. Uh, area schools and the Penfield High School is uh, named uh, was it once again named to the US News World Report 2021 list of the top 100 high schools in New York State and the district itself is ranked third out of 67 area school districts in 2020 based on four years of test scores um, that, that doesn't happen without support of our Board of Education our community our incredible teachers and staff and uh, and obviously our students and parents and so thank you um, as well as looking at just pure data, our graduation rate last year was 
Uh, 90 percent of our 2020 graduates continued on to college. 97 percent um, gra of our graduates earned a Regents Diploma and 73 percent earned an Advanced Designation, also what I lovingly call the NASCAR Diploma because you get really cool stickers for every area of Advanced Designation you get. And again, uh, focused on students really pushing uh, for rigor and um, taking study seriously. 108 uh, PHS students and 2020 graduates were named AP scholars in 2020, including uh, five national scholars, which is really uh, an incredible um, attribute of our students and families and the support we have in our K-12 program. We are more and always have been more than test scores. And so just a couple of points of pride when we talk about the, the district and what our budget that we present really helps to support is um, All Eastern Conference. Eight students were selected for the All Eastern Music Conference. Penfield Central School District was named once again a best community for music education. Our DECA competition, we had two students qualify for the national competition and six students placed in the top 10 in the state competition. That is really incredible, that DECA competition. And I talk mm -hmm. about this every year when we get to it. But for many of the high school students who out of New York that make it to nationals, they come from some of the um, highest ranked uh, uh, New York City area schools that are either charter or public schools focused solely on business. And so for our students in Penfield to be able to, to move on to nationals is really incredible. And then athletics, uh, incredible year again, girls basketball team, boys volleyball team, and ice hockey all won uh, sectional championships. And uh, not on there, but our girls cheerleading uh, uh, won counties for the first time ever in Penfield history. So we really try to pride ourselves on more than just academics and really that focus on the whole student and making sure that all students can find success in a multiple of areas uh, here at Penfield. And uh, the budget that, that the board approves and we put out to the voters and the voters have an opportunity to approve um, uh, really builds this bright future. And now I'll turn it over to Dr. Driffle to get into the details of our 2021-2022 budget. Thanks, Dr. Putnam. Uh, so for discussion this evening at our budget hearing, we'll review the budget development process, how we came uh, to this proposed budget for the community, looking at some of the goals and guidelines and the path that we've been on. The actual proposed 21-22 school budget, including uh, projected expenditures and the supporting revenues, and then some of this year's ballot propositions, some further detail about some referendums being put out to the community. So back in the fall, we start with a, a set of objectives and criteria, budget goals and guidelines that help guide us uh, as guardrails throughout the budget development process. Uh, they serve as kind of our North Star throughout the, all of the work that we do. So as Dr. Putnam mentioned, um, academic achievement and excellence, uh, some of the statistics he was able to provide in the whole lens of the whole child uh, is a first priority for us. Community partnerships for the Penfield Central School District, partnering with our, our PTAs, our parent groups, um, town organizations, uh, community organizations, different colleges in higher ed, um, Delphi services, our BOCI services, always trying to work collaboratively to find different synergies with our outside partners. Fiscal responsibility remains top of mind as a, a, a public agency. So we're always looking to have appropriate structural uh, operating surpluses, maintain strong credit ratings, um, have appropriate year-end audited financial position, ensure that we're not on the comptroller's fiscal stress list, um, some of those criteria. This year, uh, more than ever, technological capacity has been very top of mind as we build out the resources for our operating budget. Um, we fully scale the one-to-one -one initiative um, rapidly and trying to continue and harness and sustain that growth moving into next school year. Class size is always something we take a very uh, hard look at. We have a commitment to smaller class sizes here at Penfield to allow our educators to more effectively um, offer their strong pedagogy. Operational efficiency is also a landmark of Penfield Central School District, trying to um, achieve the lens of customer service through effectiveness and efficiency uh, to yield um, desirable results. And then finally, professional learning. Um, our staff, we invest in our staff. People, we're in the people business. We say that all the time. Standards are always changing with the curriculum. We're always evolving, always writing, 
um, always looking to stay abreast of what's happening, um, not just in K through 12 education, but um, beyond the walls uh, of it, PCSD. So here's just kind of a graphical look at the budget development process. Um, for those that are new to the budget development process, uh, it's a year long initiative. It starts almost as soon as uh, the first day of school, uh, building the budget calendar with the Board of Education, developing those budget factors, goals and guidelines, res reviewing the reserve planning, uh, putting out budget requests to all of our different building leaders and department managers, um, Come the turn of the calendar in January, we look to develop revenue projections based on the local tax levy and the state aid projections from the governor's executive budget address. And then throughout the spring, we're really refining appropriations, developing the budget, working with our program leaders, um, looking at when things change, new kids move into the district, annual evaluations. It's really a fluid and dynamic process that we continuously keep the board apprised uh, through budget presentations throughout the spring. And then finally, uh, the board adopts a budget, which they did on April 20th. Uh, and then we're in the last stage of the budget development process with this required budget hearing and the statewide uh, vote uh, two weeks from today on the 18th. So let's dive into it. So uh, expenditures, where does the money go? Uh, we're gonna look at this in the lens of a couple different um, frameworks. So the first of all is the budget function. Um, Budget function is broken up by general support, instruction, transportation, and undistributed costs. Within general support, we have everything related to um, Board of Education costs, the superintendent's office, the business office, uh, payroll accounts receivable, everything related to operations and maintenance, everything related to the HR function, everything related to public information, so uh, postage costs. This is where we pay for our rg and &E bills. It's also is where we pay for um, BOCES administrative costs. So the general support function year over year, uh, down $22,000 or just under a quarter of a percent. Instruction is the lion's share of the budget. Um, this year it's projected to increase $1.35 million or almost two and a half percent. Instruction comprises everything related to uh, curriculum development, professional development for staff, all of the K through 12 instruction that we provide uh, in our buildings, including special education, occupational education, technology, libraries, all the pupil services, um, social workers, psychologists, guidance counselors. It also includes all of the extracurricular activities that we offer, the clubs, and then interscholastic athletics as well. Transportation, um, kind of self-evident, that is all of the pupil transportation and then the operation of the bus garage itself, uh, basically even year over year at 0.3% uh, increase. Undistributed costs make up employee benefits, um, so everything related to employer contributions to the New York State retirement systems, health insurance, dental insurance, uh, all of our payroll taxes, uh, so FICA, Social Security, Medicare costs. Uh, additionally, within that domain are our debt service payments, both principal and interest, and then any interfund transfers that we send to other funds. Uh, so we have two primary interfund transfers. One is a support for the school lunch program, and one is a support for uh, special education summer programming. So all up, all in, uh, by function, you can see that the budget is uh, projected to increase $1.7 million, or 1.68%. Just adding a little context to where we've been and where we are, uh, these are the budget year-over-year -year increases in the last decade. Uh, you can see that we have an average of 2.36% over that time period, and the last two years uh, have been on the lower end. This 1.68% increase is, is the lowest that we've had in a decade. Another lens by which we look through our projected expenditures is by object. So you can see uh, the top line number, salaries and wages, as I alluded to before, uh, we're absolutely in the people business. And I think this year more than ever has reiterated the fact that those relationships are so crucial to the educational program that we provide. So that is scheduled to increase 1.33%. Uh, Contractual services is everything related to outside agencies, things that we don't do here. So that includes our utility costs through rg &E. it's all the professional development, uh, any outside contracts that we partner with uh, along the way. So that is scheduled to increase just $50,000 or three quarters of a percent. Uh, 
Our BOCES costs are scheduled to increase $864,000 or 7.5% uh, as we realize the aid through purchasing through BOCES. If you're not aware, we receive about 70 cents uh, on the dollar for every dollar that we spend through BOCES services. So we're always looking to try to find efficiencies to leverage that aid as revenue in, in future out years. Uh, so that is scheduled to increase this year. Equipment and materials scheduled to decrease a little over $200,000 or 7%. So this is everything related to uh, instructional materials uh, in the classrooms, paper, uh, fuel costs for the transportation garage, um, parts, supplies, inventory, uh, all the various things that uh, help us operationally run. Debt service, as I alluded to earlier, is the both principal and interest payments for any outstanding building projects that we've uh, completed in the past. This is offset by New York State building aid, which I'll touch on as we move into the revenue side of the equation. Uh, that's scheduled to increase just under 4% for next year. Employee benefits uh, up 3.3%. So as I mentioned earlier, this includes everything from the ERS and TRS systems, health insurance, uh, we participate in a consortium for health insurance to pool our risk and generate uh, more favorable premiums, uh, workers' compensation, payroll taxes, so on and so forth. So that is um, up a little over 3%. And then those interfund transfers uh, declining quite a bit next year. So again, uh, the $1.7 million difference or the 1.68% uh, relative difference. And then this is just a graphical representation again um, you know, very clearly three quarters of our expenses are, are tied up in personnel, education, uh, definitely a people business here at Penfield. So another lens of looking at the budget is the three part budget or also called the component budget. Uh, capital costs are everything related to operations and maintenance as I referred to earlier. So all the grounds upkeep, all of our cleaners, custodians, maintenance workers, those utilities, any building repair contracts, uh, things associated with safety. Administrative costs are everything related to district office uh, and the main offices in the, the schools, so the principals and all the support staff that help uh, run buildings from an operational perspective. And then everything else is programmed, so all of those educational costs, those transportation costs. Uh, year over year differences, uh, everything within about 1% uh, of where they were last year, so not too much fluctuation in those departments. So that's the uh, projected expenditure look. Uh, so where does the money come from to, to pay for all these expenses? So we'll break down all of these components. Uh, the two largest factors of our revenue are the local tax levy. So this is money that the school district collects in property taxes from all of the homeowners in the community. Uh, that represents about two thirds of our revenue. And then New York State education aid uh, represents about a third and then all other revenue combined is only 6%. So all of the revenue combined are things like any assigned fund balance, any interfund transfers, um, any insurance recoveries, any BOCES refunds, uh, admissions at games, driver's ed costs, um, so on and so forth. The interest that we receive on money in the bank, uh, all of those other components. So the big narrative uh, story this year in the budget, if you've followed the budget development process through the spring or you're interested in learning more, you can look back at the half dozen or so um, presentations that we've done. So back in January, the governor had proposed keeping education aid flat uh, essentially for what would have been a third straight year. Uh, the state economy was still in turmoil and in flux. Um, things at the federal level were obviously not yet uh, fleshed out to different transitions. And we were planning on a, a basically a, a flat state aid uh, education package. Fast forward a couple months till the first week of April and we see the New York State Legislature pass the school budget and it represented record increase in, in funding for New York State education. So for Penfield, uh, you can see where we've been in the last 10 years in our New York State education aid. Uh, we're projected to see a 10% increase or about $3 million in education aid for next year. Of that $3 million, about $2.2 .2 million <coughs> is foundation aid, which I'll touch on a little further in a moment. That's kind of the big pot of state education aid that we receive, all, all districts receive. 
And then we see a big increase in our BOCES aid um, because we spent so much money on equipment this year to go to a one-to-one -one environment for our students that we generate that aid next year uh, coming back to us. So you can see just in this chart, um, you know, the, the large increase graphically that we're set to receive for next year. So as I mentioned, New York State Foundation Aid is the largest pool uh, of our state aid package. This is a law that went on the books um, close to 14 years ago now. It was when Governor Spitzer was still in office. So right shortly thereafter, the governor's office was in turmoil. Uh, we had the Great Recession in 08, 09 with the financial crisis, and the state couldn't quite uh, live up to their commitment to meet these foundation aid uh, rules. So what we received is in Penfield is in the far left column in foundation aid paid. Uh, the middle column, foundation aid formula, is what we were set to receive. And then the final column on the right is the gap on an annual basis from what we received to what we were relatively owed. You can see cumulatively, um, you know, approaching $70 million in gap. Uh, but the good news down at that bottom line for next year, 21-22, is we're seeing such a sizable increase this year. As I mentioned, a $2.2 million increase in foundation aid. Um, I will note that we are still due $22 million, 22.1. So we're still short, theoretically, $6 million. Mm -hmm. I will note that in this year's legislative budget, the legislature has committed to um, meeting this foundation aid over the next uh, a three-year term, so not next year, but the following two years after that. Uh, that is a feel-good um, message at this point. It's certainly not set in stone, just like school districts, the New York State budget is appropriated on an annual basis, so that certainly can change. We've heard that before in the past, but it was a positive um, commitment and intention from the state legislature that you know we're already looking into the 22-23 year to make sure that they uh, follow up on that commitment. Additionally, there has been a lot in the way of federal aid. We keep hearing all about these different um, federal packages and what do they look like uh, for Penfield Central. So the CARES Act was the, pass, the act that was passed last March, March of 2020, right after COVID um, kind of came in fast and furious. It was contained as a state aid revenue within the 2020-21 school year, this current school year. Uh, we only received $340,000, of which we had to share it with some of our non-public schools uh, in the region. So it wasn't, uh, for us, as demonstrable an impact as it was for some other districts. Fast forward to SIRSA, the Coronavirus Relief and Response Supplemental Appropriation Act that was passed this past December of 2020, and the American Rescue Plan Act, ARPA, that was just passed uh, in late March of this year. So these are going to flow to Penfield as multi-year grants. Uh, they're treated as one-time supplemental money that is outside of the general fund operating budget, uh, and they have some mandated spending rules associated with them. Uh, the SIRSA funds were actually released today, uh, updated. So Penfield is set to receive $4 million um, from that federal stimulus package in December. Those funds expire in September of 2023. Uh, so, again, this is going to be a multi-year commitment. They need to be spent on um, what is loosely defined as learning loss. Uh, there are rules around how much of the money we have to spend on an annual basis. Um, so we'll have more information coming out about federal aid. And then the ARPA funds were $2.5 million, and those um, expire in September of 2024. Uh, and what we heard today is that might be actually delayed 120 days, so it might uh, end up being January of 2025. The important takeaway with the federal aid dollars is that they're substantial. Uh, we see them as a, a strong resource to really uh, have a positive yield um, on our kiddos' lives, uh, but they don't affect next year's operating budget. They're not an operating fund budget for the general fund. Um, they're a set-aside supplemental revenue. So with the uh, state aid numbers, uh, we always look at our local levy because uh, that's within our locus of control, whereas the state education aid is a bit outside of our, our sphere of influence. So back in early uh, spring, we need to submit to the state comptroller, the Department of Tax and Finance, our tax cap calculation. So this law has been on the books for about a decade now. I think it was 2011 where the local levy limit laws. 
And what this does is define a cap that a Board of Education and school districts across the state can levy on the community, whereby they only need 50% approval of the community to pass the budget. If they go over that maximum allowable levy amount, uh, they need a supermajority approval defined by New York State as 60%. I'll quickly walk through the mechanics of this because I think it's always a fascinating discussion. So you start with last year's levy. So that was just under $67 million. It's multiplied by the tax base growth factor, which comes from the state of New York. We don't have any number there. That is, in theory is new permitted growth within the boundaries of your school community. You uh, add in any prior year pilot revenue. So a pilot, for those that don't know the acronym, is a payment in lieu of taxes, which is usually negotiated outside of the taxing jurisdiction, the school district, the county, or the town. In our case, by the County Industrial Development Agency, uh, Comita, to spur on new business opportunities. Uh, subtract any prior year exclusions, of which we did not have any. You multiply that by the allowable growth factor, which by the formula is defined as the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, or what we refer to as a general marker for inflation. When this formula came about, um, everyone started calling this the 2% tax cap, and this is the line where that 2% comes from. So in this year, it was 1.23% increase um, for inflation for calendar year 2020, by law, in the calculation, it can't be more than 2%. So if inflation were to be running at 2.5%, for instance, that line would still be 2.0. It wouldn't be able to go over 2. If it's under 2, it is what it actually is. So then you subtract any pilot uh, scheduled payments for the coming year. You add in any available carryover from your prior year levy calculation. Again, we did not have any. And that gets you to um, the maximum allowable levy. So all throughout the spring, based on the governor's projections in January, uh, we were thinking that we'd be levying right up to the cap. Uh, we were projecting that through all of our budget presentations uh, as necessary revenue to support our budget. But based on um, that influx of state aid, revenue that we just discussed, uh, primarily through foundation aid, uh, we are going to be keeping the levy flat for next year. Um, so there'll be no increase in the tax levy. Uh, that tax levy increase represented about $1.3 million or a 1.97% year over year increase. That foundation aid being a $2.2 million increase when we were thinking we would maybe see no increase, uh, provided us the opportunity to keep our levy flat year over year. Um, so the 21-22 school budget requires no additional tax levy dollars, and the tax levy that's ultimately adopted by the Board of Education come August uh, will ref reflect a 0% increase. Uh, so it'll stay at that $66,895,988 figure. So you might be asking, what does that mean for me uh, as, as a homeowner in the community? So. It, we as a district set the tax levy, that's within our, our sphere of influence, um, and then the actual tax rate implications are determined by the assessments in your town uh, and the equalization rate that's determined by the state of New York. So if you're new to what equalization rate means, it's essentially the uh, calculation of what your assessed value is, your official assessed value in your town by your town assessor versus what the market value is of your home if you were to sell it on the open market. You can see in the last four years that there's been a general decline in equalization rates because house values have increased so much that assessors typically haven't caught up with all of that new uh, price volume. And you can see the tentative uh, levels of assessment for next year, and I should stress that they're tentative, they're in red, um, they can still change come, come summer when they're actually finalized, are again mostly scheduled to decline. You can see a decline in Penfield, uh, Parrington stays the same year over year, decline in Pittsburgh, decline in Brighton, decline in Macedon. Walworth did a reassessment this year, so they went from 86%, so theoretically 14% under market value, all the way up to 100% or market value. So just the tax bill refresher. Um, how is your actual tax bill uh, compiled? So I think this is a helpful graphic. Uh, it represents two different houses in two different towns. 
So as I'll discuss in a moment, Penfield is unique in that we have six different town uh, localities in our district across two different counties. Our two largest towns are by far Brighton and Penfield. So take, for instance, this example being a, a house in Brighton and a house in Penfield. Both houses are equal sized, equal amenities, uh, equal lot, equal square footage, equal bathrooms, uh, equal bedrooms, so on. If you sold it on the open market, $250,000 house. Uh, the house in town A is assessed at $185,000, whereas the house in town B is assessed at that full $250,000 of market value. The equalization rate, therefore, in town A is only 74%, so 26% undervalued. So the tax rate in that town is higher than the tax rate in town B. However, you can see the bottom line, or maybe not see, but you can see hopefully online or see at home if you want to check the graphic, it's the same tax bill. So the equalization rate comes in as a system of equity uh, so that no assessor can underassess and therefore have higher taxes on the other towns within the locality. So it's always a bit of a nebulous process. I think a lot of people don't necessarily understand it, so I always like to make sure uh, we dive into exactly how the school tax bill is calculated. So here is the estimated local tax impact of the $0 tax levy uh, and those projected changes to equalization rates. Uh, I should stress with the asterisk and the caveat that these are just current projections. They, they will absolutely change by the time the board adopts the warrant in August. Uh, the equalization rates aren't final until July. The town assessments aren't final until July. There's always changes in star exemptions and star uh, changes people aging up to the enhanced star, people coming off of them because of the income requirements. So there's always some minor modifications. But by and large, these are pretty strong projections that shouldn't deviate too much. So if you live in the town of Brighton, a uh, projected tax rate increase of 2%. If you live in the town of Penfield, a projected tax rate decrease of 0.8%. Parrington, 3% uh, decline. Pittsford, 1% increase. Macedon, 7% increase. And then remember, Walworth, they went from that 86% equalization rate to that 100% equalization rate. So the assessments were lifted up in that community. So therefore, the tax rate uh, is scheduled to come down quite a bit. So one of the things we really try to look at is the true value tax rate, because it's a representative sample of all of the six towns across the two counties throughout the, the school district. And that true value tax rate is scheduled to decline uh, 72 cents per thousand dollars of assessed value or a little over three percent again best rate projection this will be in the newsletter that's published to the community uh, next week um, but still subject to change a little bit so then in the context of where we've been true value tax rate wise in the last dozen years you can see we've been very stable uh, kind of like a little bit of an increase in the middle 2015 2016 era as state aid was very tight uh, and then a decline in the last couple of years. So here's the full look at the budgeted revenues to support those appropriations that we discussed earlier. Uh, the local levy, as mentioned before, uh, it will be 0% increase. Uh, that $15,000 increase or 0.02% there is an expected increase in pilot payments uh, through our originally scheduled pilots. We have two pilots currently. New York State education aid, as I discussed, scheduled to see a big increase of that $3 million or over 10%. County sales taxes, we actually are fortunate enough to live in a community where the county shares sales taxes with the school districts, both Monroe and Wayne share. They're one of only about a handful of counties now in the state that do so. Uh, based on the improving economy and things reopening, we project those to get back to normal levels this year, um, more around that 3.9% a million dollar revenue source for the district. Uh, miscellaneous, uh, those things I mentioned earlier, all the other sources of revenue that happen to flow to the district. The primary reason for that projected decline this year is the low interest rate environment that we currently find ourselves in. Uh, and then assigned fund balance uh, scheduled to decrease quite a bit this year, um, down 77% uh, as we're able to de decrease our reliance on fund balance due to that increased state aid. And then just like last year, I'd like to point out, we have no budgeted use of any of our reserve funds and we don't need to rely on any interfund transfer as a supplemental revenue for the budget. Again, bringing us back to that $104 million number for next year, the $1.7 million increase or 1.68%. So just another graphic of the balanced budget year over year with both expenditures and projected revenues on there. Um, you can dive into that 
at your leisure. So just some of the key budget takeaways as we try to develop um, or sum summarize where we've been these last six months. So there are absolutely no programmatic or staffing reductions uh, in this budget. We're able to maintain the same high quality, consistent academic programming for our students. Uh, as discussed, there's a zero dollar change in the tax levy due to the large state funding increase. Uh, still within this budget, we have built in flexibility to navigate what is certain uncertainty ahead. Uh, we know that uh, school districts are not uh, immune from economic conditions, variable factors that can affect our costs or our revenues. Um, so we have a, a balance of safety to know that we're gonna be okay uh, with this budget moving forward. And then whole student investments. So we're looking for an assistant superintendent of equity and access to be ingrained across all of the district operations from curriculum to uh, finance, um, code of conduct, everything we do with staffing, so on and so forth. And then we also have an additional 1.6 social workers contained in this budget. One is a district-wide position and then more support within the buildings as well. So in addition to that first uh, school operating budget referendum uh, on the ballot for May 18th and two weeks from today, uh, we have a couple other ballot propositions. Uh, so first of all is a land purchase. So this is a 40 acre parcel that we contracted uh, with the property owner last spring um, to put to a referendum to the community. It's at the north east corner of Jackson and Plank. Uh, as I mentioned, it's 40 acres and the $802,000 authorization for that property. Uh, this will be paid from our existing 2016 capital reserve. Um, so the money's already been set aside and encumbered. Uh, so there's no associated tax impact. There's no new revenue requirements um, for this proposition. That is the intended future site of a transportation and buildings and grounds facility as we look to move our, our current operation that we've outgrown off of Five Mile. The third ballot proposition is a bus purchase. Um, so we'll be looking to buy seven large buses this year, 66 passenger buses in accordance with our bus replacement schedule. Uh, it's at a maximum aggregate cost of $870,388, uh, 480 of which comes from general fund appropriations and another 390,000 388 from the capital reserve for bus purchases. The fourth proposition is a new 2021 capital reserve for buildings. Uh, so we currently have two capital reserves, a 2014 capital reserve and a 2016 capital reserve for buildings that are both fully funded to their authorized statutes. Um, so looking to create a, a new reserve as we plan ahead for future capital work. And then finally, our, our board of education election where we have three uh, three year terms there are nine candidates for those three open seats uh, and they are in ballot order as shown here. And again, the uh, statewide budget vote and board election is always the uh, third Tuesday of May. So this year it's Tuesday, May 18th. Uh, we do have those extended hours, 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. at the Penfield High School gym. As I alluded to earlier, there is much more information available on our website under the quick links on the left side of the page under the 21-22 budget. Everything related to uh, all the budget development process, all the different disclosures associated. So with that, Dr. Putnam, Mr. Elich, I will turn it back over to you. All right, thank you. Since this is a public hearing, this is an opportunity for public comment on the budget. Uh, we will still have our normal visitor speaking time where you can discuss any topic you choose. But at, at this point in time, the comments should be focused specifically on the budget presentation that, was, that you just saw. If you'd like to comment on the budget, please come up to the microphone. And then please state your name and address. How are you doing? Rich Tyson, 21 Old Top. Can you repeat the percentage of our budget that comes from state aid again, please? Uh, about a third. A third of the budget comes from state aid? Yep. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions? 
All right, and once again, we will have a visitor speaking time in a short period. Now I'll make, make a brief statement. At our last meeting, the board adopted the 2021-22 budget at, the, at a time when we were still dealing with the impacts of this pandemic, juggling work responsibilities, home life, social distancing, hybrid and virtual learning has had us all feeling stressed and wondering when we will go back to normal. We understand the sacrifices that everyone in our community has been making and how challenging this year has been. <clears throat> we especially want to thank our parents, teachers and staff who despite all of these concerns have worked together to ensure our students continued learning. In addition to dealing with COVID, we have continued conducting important business of the district, including develop a budget patrol budget, a proposed budget for the 2021-22 school year. Overall, the budget proposal is $104,343,650, which represents a 1.68% increase over the current year's budget. On the revenue side of the budget, we are proposing a 0% tax levy increase. We know many families have lost jobs and have had been impacted financially by the pandemic and felt it was important to keep the levy flat while still maintaining our educational program. In addition to the general fund budget, there will be three additional propositions on the ballot. These include the proposed purchase of land at the corner of Plank and Jackson Roads for a future transportation center, the purpose of, I'm sorry, the purchase of seven budget buses to continue our bus replacement program and the authorization of a new capital reserve fund to support future capital projects. Please note that this year's vote is being held in person from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Tuesday, May 18th at the Penfield High School gym. With that, the annual budget hearing has ended. Thank you, and we will now return to our regular meeting. And with that, it is recommended that the Board of Education approve the consent agenda. We have a motion and a second that the uh, that the board approve the, the consent agenda. So moved. Second. Any questions or comments? Then before we go, I, I had my screen up a little bit, so let me read that off. I apologize. Uh, the approval of the minutes from April twentieth, twenty twenty one and April 22nd, 2021 as submitted, the acceptance of the recommendation from the Committee of Special Education, the recommendation, uh, acceptance of the recommendations from the Committee of Preschool Special Education, the acceptance of the recommendations from the Superintendent for Personal Changes, Personnel Changes, and the approval of request to dispose of unserviceable serviceable textbooks. So again, I'll, I'll re-ask, may I have a motion and a second? So moved. Second. Any questions or comments? All those in favor? Any opposed? Right, motion carries. And then that's recommended we, we have the treasury report, which includes the cash report, general fund cash report, the general fund revenue status report, the general fund balance status report, the school lunch fund cash report, and the school run, lunch fund reserve and expense budget report for the month ending May 31st, 2021 be approved. We have a motion and a second. So moved. Second. Any questions or comments? All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion carries. We have no special reports today. And we we're going to, so we will go straight to visitor speaking time. First uh, speaker, Carolyn Curran. And then please state your name and address. Hi, my name is Carolyn Curran, and I live at 1547 Jackson Road in Penfield. Thank you to each of you on our school board. My family feels lucky to live in this community with such a wonderful school district, and your work is very much appreciated. 
When my family moved to Rochester to the area 11 years ago, we chose to buy our property in Penfield for two main reasons. First and foremost was because the school district was so highly rated with a focus on excellence in music. Thank you for keeping a strong focus on music. It is so important to our students and our community. The second reason we moved to Penfield was to have a quiet piece of land in the country. We moved here from a crowded town with constant traffic streaming by our house, and we wanted more of a country setting. Now we have a beautiful cornfield across the road from us and enjoy the peace and quiet of our property with a uh, thousand acre swamp behind us. <laughs> Amazing bird watching, quiet walks along Jackson Road down to Memorial Park and back. Throughout the day, many people walk, bike, rollerblade, and run up and down Jackson Road in front of our house where the speed limit is 35 miles an hour, pretty slow, not uh, compared to Route 250, which is 55 miles an hour. Um, I'm here tonight to express my opposition to the proposal to purchase and develop land at the corner of Plank Road and Jackson Road for the new bus garage and transportation center. After reviewing the surveys and reports done for the soil, water, wetlands, and traffic, I was left to wonder how about doing some surveys on the impact this project will have on the people living near it, as well as the wildlife in the area. With the additional trips of 110 plus employees arriving and leaving not once, but twice each school day for work, and with the addition of the 100 drivers making multiple trips, bus trips each school day, the traffic on Jackson Road and Plank Road will increase exponentially. Imagine for a minute how it would be to have 135 additional vehicles, uh, this number's from the traffic study, driving outside your bedroom window every morning, weekday morning from 6.30, 6 .30 a.m. to 7.30 a.m. Precious wildlife live in the area with deer families crossing the road twice daily by our house. Birds of all kinds nest in our area, including flocks of wild turkeys that roam through from time to time. Adding so much additional traffic would impact the quality of life for all of us, people and wildlife in the vicinity in a negative way and bring down our property value. Overlaying this type of commercial industrial use into a residential agricultural area is very concerning. It would no longer be pleasant or safe to walk, bike, rollerblade, um, and run up and down Jackson Road with the heavy traffic that the new garage and transportation center would bring. I encourage a vote against the purchase of land or development at the corner of Jackson Road and Plank Road for the new garage and transportation center. Thank you for the opportunity to share my, my view tonight. Thank you, Ms. Curran. The next speaker is Rich Tyson. So, Mr. Tyson, please um, list your name and address. Yes, Rich Tyson, 21 Knolltop. So I thank you again for giving me a few moments to speak to you this evening. So I want to touch on two things real quick, and then I'll get out of your way so you can get out of the meeting. So um, last month I stopped in and shared a little update from the real estate community and kind of what's going on in New York. Yesterday you may have noticed that New York State Legislature opted to extend the moratorium out till the end of August 31st. The reason for doing so they don't have a plan to get the $2.3 billion in aid that's been allocated to the states into the proper hands of tenants that are behind on rent so that they can pay housing providers. The only reason they're extending this moratorium is they've failed to put a plan together for the entire state for tenants that are in need. Again, I'll say, if we're going to rely in this community on people in Albany to create plans to get us back in school, or for anything for that matter, we are totally lost. We've elected you folks, you've hired him. We need you to be the voice of our local community for our students to have a plan on keeping kids in school and getting them educated. So the other thing I wanna to touch on is an issue that a lot of people don't like touching on, although it seems to be very popular these days, DEI. It was apparently one of the most popular questions of the candidate forum that you all attended the other evening. And I'd like to just share a couple personal experiences that I have in that and hopefully it'll inform you uh, as you go forward. So 
I was lucky enough to have attended Gates Child High Schools. Um, I even had Mrs. Babiars' husband as a teacher at one point. Um, we, we were in that school, we were taught to be colorblind. We were taught that everybody's equal and that you treat people that way. And I pride myself on relying on some of those very relationships that I've had since kindergarten when I served on the Race Commission, the Race and Structural Equity Commission here a few months ago, which was a collaborative effort between Monroe County and the city of Rochester, looking at many aspects of how race affects this community, I was thankfully able to offer my voice on how it affects housing. And I called on some of those very people, black people that I've known since kindergarten, to help inform me so that I could be better prepared for that conversation. Now, fast forward, I get out of high school, and I decided to join the United States military. The great equalizer. They'll take you, they'll give you the same haircut, the same horrible pair of uh, eyeglasses if you need them, and they'll put you in a uniform. Why? Because they want everybody to look at everybody else as an equal, as a, as a, as a, a counterpart that is no better or worse. It doesn't matter if you come in as a wealthy kid or a dirt poor kid. You're gonna be equalized in boot camp, you're gonna be broken down, and you're gonna be built back up as part of a team and in that team environment, relationships are formed, very deep relationships. One of the, I got out of the military in 2004. One of the best relationships I have is with a black man, Mr. Beatty, who lives in Florida. I was proud 10 years ago to stand up in his wedding when he married his wife, who was half Mexican and half white. They have beautiful children together now, and still a person that I relish that relationship with today. The military never told us to treat each other differently or better or worse because of what we looked like when we showed up. We were part of a team. We were part of a common goal and we had a common mission. And in that, we rallied around each other. Now, after I got out of the military, I moved back to Rochester. I went to work for Paytech Communications and I met a beautiful woman at Paytech that thankfully fell in love with my dog and I was the baggage and she fell in love with me over time. My wife is from Thailand. We grew up in different cultures, speaking different languages, eating different food, different experiences overall. We didn't fall in love with each other. Well, she fell in love with the dog. She then came to accept me. But we did so by finding the things that we found in common with each other. It wasn't the differences that made us fall in love. It was the things that we had in common. And in, do and in falling in love over those commonalities, we then were able to celebrate our differences. So. I have a daughter that doesn't look like me, thankfully. She looks like my wife. She looks like a little Asian kid. I don't want my kid coming to school and being advantaged or disadvantaged or being taught that others should do one of those two things based on the fact that she doesn't look white. I want her treated with respect and I want her treating others with respect. And if you guys need a good local leader that I think could help inform what that process should look like, look no further than Grandmaster Kim at Master Kim's Taekwondo. My daughter just achieved her black belt. She'll be receiving her official black belt from Korea in a few weeks here. And when they go to class, they're not separated by race. They're not separated by physical differences and characteristics. They're put in that room together. They're broken out by skill set. And they're taught that they have to have respect first for themselves, then for the other people on the mat, certainly for Master Kim, their parents in the back of the room, and the people outside of that dojon when they leave that and go into the broader community. Let's make sure that these kids first respect themselves, then respect each other, respect administrators, staff, the guy that cuts the lawn, I don't care who it is. That's the way that DEI turns into something even broader, no. the big R word, respect. Mr. Tyson, that was five minutes. Yeah, that's fine. I appreciate your time. Let's do well. Thank Great. you. Thank you, Mr. Tyson. Thank you. Which brings us now to the superintendent's report. All right. Uh, so we have uh, uh, just two updates, uh, student and staff honors, some cool things to mention, and then an update around everyone's favorite topic, COVID and reopening. So really cool, Indian Landing kindergarten teacher, Kim Saxon, was recently honored by Channel 8's Golden Apple Award for being a great teacher. Congratulations to Kim, that's already aired. It's really awesome to watch and it's on the uh, webpage if you wanna go and see that, the Channel 8 page. So um, just, a, just a, a great way to honor our teachers at doing incredible things for our students. And speaking of teachers doing incredible stuff for our kids, this week is National Teacher Appreciation Week. So I'd like to take a moment um, to give special thanks to our teachers for their dedication and hard work, especially during these challenging times. 
Our teachers have been unwavering in their dedication to our students and their continued learning despite the many challenges posed by this pandemic. We are incredibly proud of Team Penfield and truly thank you for all your efforts on behalf of our students. So if you know a teacher uh, in your family or they teach one of your children or you see one on the street, please give them a virtual hug because we're not allowed to hug with COVID, but please say thank you to all of our incredible teachers here in Penfield and around the area. It is also uh, coming up May 12th next week, but we don't have a board meeting, is National School Nurse Day. And so we also want to just take a moment to celebrate and recognize the contributions of our school nurses. Uh, we can't thank them enough for what they are doing to ensure the health and safety of our students and staff during these trying times. And they are truly appreciated today and every day. And just as uh, we talk about championing the whole student, our school nurses do it. And this year, more than ever, um, our school nurses are, are, are RNs. They are incredible professionals. They could uh, walk into hospitals and they choose to work in schools for many different reasons. But uh, this year with COVID, they've also been tapped as the medical professionals uh, on our team that can really dig into that uh, guidance and support our school. So thank you to our school nurses. Uh, here uh, locally in our school board is a New York State School Board Association recognition. So New York State School Board Association recognition program is designed to acknowledge school board members who continually strive to expand their governance knowledge and skills. The program is comprised of four achievement levels and congratulations to Emily Belser who achieved level one board achievement award for participation in NISBA leadership development training opportunities totaling 75 points. Emily, congratulations. This is sort of like a golden apple because your award is in a golden folder. So I'm gonna bring this to you. Those are awards are great reminders of the amount of PD our school board does. Uh, they're all volunteers all the time and they continue to strive to learn more and do better. And so uh, nice job, Emily, thank you. And now uh, get into some updates. So just as a reminder, and just I'll, I'll uh, share this, we do have four reopening advisory committees. Uh, all four of our committees are meeting independently. Uh, the focus is on the full return in September 2021 and a virtual program for K-12 pending New York State requirement. I'm comfortable sharing here, although it has not been uh, acknowledged officially that we have to have a virtual program as a requirement next year. Uh, the talk out of Albany is that that is probably what's going to happen. So it, it, it is more likely that we have to have one than we won't. Um, but I always do like to say that it's pending New York State requirement. If it's not a requirement, then it would be up to the district to determine if that's what they uh, want to support. And so they're using the current New York State uh, DOH guidance, the most updated, and they'll review any updated guidance as it's released. Um, I, I am not alone from uh, Mr. Tyson. I can share that. Uh, will the state give us new guidance between now and September? Uh, I'm not putting any money on it. So we're gonna use our current guidance and build a program to be a full return come September based on this guidance. If they give us something that's more lenient and more we are able to work with, great. But let's plan with what we have right now with the time and the knowledge and the expertise to make sure that we can come back. So be really clear for the community is that uh, the full committee, uh, sorry, the full committee is online. We've shared this before, but uh, to make it really clear for the community uh, and for our staff and students that the Board of Education and the district are committed to a full return in September. I said it at last meeting, I've said it in my emails. We are coming back in September. I had a meeting today with superintendents from across the county. Uh, we're all in the same boat. We don't know what will happen, what will change, but we will find a way with the time to, to come back in September uh, K-12. We have to, we have to for our students, we have to for our community, we have to for our parents and for the impact on daycare. We will find a way and are fully committed to coming back in September. Um, we're not done though. We still have seven weeks left of school. And so um, if you've noticed that my staff knows and, and families, uh, when they get letters from me, sometimes I, I share my love of quotes. And so Winston Churchill is, is one of my favorites. 
I've had a portrait of uh, Winston Churchill uh, in my office since I was a social studies teacher. It's a great uh, portrait that the uh, Germans used as propaganda during World War II. It's a great story. We can talk about it someday outside the board <laughs> meeting. But one of, the, one of my favorite quotes is, never give up on something that you can't go a day without thinking about. And so as we look at reopening still in this school year, I think it is fair to say that every board member and uh, every district administrator and staff across Penfield probably has not stopped thinking about how we can reopen under the current guidance that we have. And I can tell you that uh, I know because the board and I talk one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, all the time about what we can do and, and they do a very nice job uh, pushing me to find ways and think outside the box and they have great ideas too. So thank you to the board for that. And uh, this quote I think is telling. So here we go. A little timeline update is that on April 6th, we released a plan uh, to reopen K-12 schools on uh, April 19th. I was really excited. I got high fives from my children. It was awesome. And three days later, New York State released their updated guidance, which was not what we were expecting because they tied it directly to the CDC community transition, uh, transmission rates and required cohorting and went in a high transmission red zone. So that was on the 9th. So on April 12th, we communicated back out again and you know, it, it, it felt like I had my tail between my legs as a superintendent and a father, because uh, there were no high fives on April 12th, that due to that new guidance, we were unable to get kids back from 612 because we couldn't cohort. So on April 19th, we moved forward. We were able to get our K-5 kids back. They're in their third week of school back uh, five days a week. They're doing great. Our staff is doing great. That first week was like, Welcome back to school in September. It was a little shaky and nobody really knew where to go. Uh, and we're back in and, and, and we're doing well. Um, so April 12th to April 30th, when I say nonstop work to determine how we can cohort at the middle school and high school, it has been nonstop working with Dr. Mendoza um, when we have ideas, working with superintendents, reaching out to other schools outside of Monroe County, working with our school board, talking to our principals, working with our school nurses, reviewing the guidance, really digging into how we can make this happen. So the biggest piece is around this cohort concept. Sorry if my frustration comes out in me screaming through my mask. So New York State guidance requires schools to use cohorts in order to return to in-person instruction at three feet distance when in the high transmission red zone. We are clearly in a high transmission red zone because you have to use the countywide data. We've been pushing and you've heard me, we've been pushing about using school metrics. We've been pushing about using our vaccination rate, our in-school testing, even let us use Penfield zip codes as our transmission rate. We'd still be in the red zone, but maybe it's a better chance to get there. The th there are three middle schools on the west side of Mineral County that are able to reopen by using houses, or they call them teams, as a cohort. And so I took some uh, phone calls and talked with people via email and in Wegmans because at Bay Trail, we have a house system. Everybody knows if you have a kid in Bay Trail, they're either house A, B, C, or Gryffindor. So there are three house systems in Bay Trail. However, even though it looks like the outside that it would be really easy to cohort because we have houses, our students are not actually in a cohort. So in their core courses, most of the time they're going to be with their house students. But for all of the specials, they go inter-house. So your PE class, your art class, your home and careers class, they're going to have kids from house A, B, and C. And when you hit eighth grade, we offer living environment and algebra. Those are all cross-housed. At lunch, it's all kids eating lunch together. So house A, B, and C. So it's not a cohort. We can't pretend it is a cohort, but we're not done trying. Goes back to that Winston Churchill quote. So Bay Trail Middle School does have three grade levels, sixth, seventh, and eighth. Students are cohorted by grade level. The grade levels only, only interact during bus rides and passing time. All of our classes have all sixth graders in them, all seventh graders in them, or all eighth graders, including all of our specials at middle school. So using grade level cohorts would allow us the opportunity to bring our middle school students back five days per week. We'd still have a virtual program. Our return date that we're looking at right now is Monday, May 17th. This allows five full weeks of time for in-person instruction. I've said repeatedly when asked, 
There are districts that went out and said, if we can't get an answer by this date, we're going to call it. I won't do that. I have said we're going to keep fighting to find out because I think any time we get back in more traditional five-day-a-week instruction is benefiting our kids. And so we are looking at May 17th as a return for our middle schools. So a couple school-wide notes. Students will be distanced at least three feet in classrooms. They'll be distanced at least six feet for lunch. They have to be distanced six feet for PE and music performance. So your typical music class, if they're not playing instruments, that, that's the three foot rule. The minute they're playing instruments or singing, it's six feet. Masks are required for all students and staff. There's lots of talk out there about wearing masks outside if you're vaccinated and things like that. As a school district, and based on the CDC and New York State guidance, we are continuing to require masks. What, what families and businesses want to do outside is fine, but as a school, we're going to continue that safety piece and wear masks uh, throughout the rest of the school year. Our ventilation systems, we have reviewed uh, throughout the year. They meet all requirements, and uh, the weather is changing, finally. It's, you know, it's only May. Uh, for allowing windows to be open for air circulation and potential for classes to get outside for outdoor learning. Um, our focus is going to be social emotional learning supporting the last five weeks of act academics. You know, we've heard from community members, we've heard from students, we've heard from parents. We know that this year under hybrid has had an impact on our students socially and emotionally. And so, I know it's five weeks, but I'm telling you, we have not given up, and nor are we going to start uh, throwing in the towel anytime soon. So, some instructional notes. How do we do this? What does it look like? Can we get everybody back? There are some impacts to this. Uh, some student schedule changes may be required. So, if you are a virtual student coming back, or if you are in a classroom where you are only one virtual student, there's a, there is going to have to be some schedule changes. And I just met with Bay Trail staff before I came over here tonight, and uh, families uh, will get a call from Bay Trail to discuss the, the schedule change that may need to happen. Uh, all of our schedule changes, we're going to do everything we can to make sure that even though there's a schedule change, the student would stay with the same teacher, might not be the same period of the day. Um, but again, they're going to get phone calls from Bay Trail staff to work through any schedule changes. Teachers. Uh, may need to teach one period synchronously. That means uh, in-person kids and virtual students at the same time. So right now, looking at the schedule, uh, it's fair to say that most teachers at Bay Trail will have one class in their day that's going to have to be taught synchronously. So <clears throat> teachers will have uh, several options or four options we have on how to teach synchronously. We have some technology that we have worked with schools that are doing synchronous now, specifically Fairport and HFL. We have some technology purchased that will help that. We also have some ways to do that through Teams, and uh, we're going to give teachers an opportunity to pick the one that's most comfortable. I'm encouraging them to try a couple through the five-week time period. Our district technology department and our Office of Professional Learning will support the rollout of the devices and the training. And I got to be really clear as when we share this with the community and with parents is that it is five weeks and, and we're calling this a pilot. I'll be up front. It is not going to be perfect when you have to teach synchronous and you've never done it before. We've done some training, not enough, and we need to do more now that we know we have to do this in two weeks. However, it's going to provide tremendous feedback as we look to next year. If we're doing virtual next year, we realize that there is a, a, a real opportunity here to do synchronous and do it well. And so this will be uh, data from the ground from our teachers who are in the classrooms working on this and really work to uh, bring us that data on which of these options works best, what do we need to change, what technology do we need to purchase, what can we look at. And so that really is the biggest impact of bringing kids back. In some classes, um, it's, it's just the way that the schedule is. And in order to um, limit the number of schedule changes, the, the cleanest way to do this is that teachers have to teach one class synchronous based on their schedule. Uh, we could avoid this and do about two, we've looked at it, the data, we could make 250 schedule changes to students. 150 schedule changes would be kids getting different teachers, and to do that in the last five weeks of school is not good for kids. And so I want to be fair and honest, I met with Baytrail staff, they are awesome, and they are a little worried because they've never had to 
teach synchronously and I have continued to say we're going to try this. It's going to be a pilot. We're going to learn a lot. I'm, I'm going to share with parents it, it, with, you know, a, as we get closer that we're going to ask for everybody's grace and compassion and understanding that this is new for everybody, but it's going to give us great data and we're going to work through to support our kids and our staff. So um, I've talked with staff. I've talked with the community. And now we really need to get uh, parent uh, uh, support. And so we're going to be hosting three Zoom meetings. This will all come out in an email tomorrow to families. We're going to be hosting three uh, Zoom meetings, um, uh, two on May 10th and one on May 11th. And we, we're trying to break it up for sixth grade families, seventh grade families, and eighth grade families. You only have to attend one. It'll be the same presentation, uh, but we want an opportunity to get it to as many people as possible. It's uh, you know, our Zoom accounts allow us to host 300 participants, and so um, you know I want to try to make sure we can get as everybody in. So if we do it by grade level, we should be good to go. Um, all the Zoom presentations are going to be the same. Families only need to attend one, and we will ask a survey question. Uh, near the end of this Zoom asking families, parents and families and guardians if they support this plan. Part of the CDC guidance is if you're going to move forward with something, you need to make sure that you have the community support for their risk tolerance. I have surveys that say we want kids back uh, from teachers and from parents, and so I, I feel comfortable. But now that we have this plan for middle school that will have a bit of an impact on instruction, I want to make sure that everybody's uh, that we have a good enough support system, and, and I think we do. Um, maybe speaking as a father of two middle schoolers, uh, I know how I vote. So um, that is our plan for this rollout. A letter will come out tomorrow with more detail and uh, we're not giving up uh, until we can get all kids back. So uh, more to come there, but um, again, uh, we're continuing to look at that guidance and, and shift in what we can do. Um, Penfield High School, a little tricky. So we're unable to cohort PHS without an overhaul of the entire schedule. Uh, if you have a high school student, you realize this. Students are not in cohorts by content or by grade levels. So our students, because of the great mix that you can pick in all of the courses, many of our courses have students in multiple grade levels, our lunches kids eat in multiple grade levels. Um, um, it's, it's, it is, I hate the word impossible, but it's really difficult to just shift into a cohort model at the high school. But we're continuing to work through every scenario and all possibilities. And our focus though, as we continue to move through this year, is supporting SEL and academics and year-end celebrations. So kudos to the high school that hasn't stopped and they've, they had a great prom event last Friday. Uh, they got senior ball, they got senior events, they got graduation plan, they got breakfast, sunrise breakfast on Frontier Field. Uh, they're putting a lot of things in place realizing that this year uh, has not been the year of your high school seniors dreams, but trying to find ways to celebrate with the class and think outside the box. And I give them a lot of kudos and the parents. The parents of our high school seniors have been absolutely amazing in terms of their support and finding ways to celebrate our seniors um, and try to give them the, the best send off uh, we can in this world of uh, living in a pandemic. So high school, we're still working on. I'm not giving up, um, but right now our focus for the next week is gonna be um, um, Patriot Middle School. The reason May 17th is selected, just so you know, too, is we got the okay, the green light on Friday. I met with administrators yesterday morning, met with staff today. We need that time to talk with parents and make sure they understand. And then um, we're still moving stuff. So there's a great deal of furniture that still needs to get moved over at Bay Trail. There are some schedule changes that need to be made and transportation is now working um, nonstop to make sure that we can get all of the new schedules um, uploaded. We did the same with K-5. There might be some uh, changes by you know five, 10 minutes of when pickup is and when drop off is and we wanna make sure we communicate that. Um, I will tell you the last piece is, just to be open here and we'll put it in our letter tomorrow, is we are also working on making sure staff are fully prepared for this. So I did tell staff today, I have not talked with the board yet, um, but we're gonna be looking at do we need one day of asynchronous learning so our staff can do full day PD, 
you know, absolute sort of powerhouse through of everything that they can do to be prepared. So we're looking at that um, and, and uh, we'll get that information out as soon as possible. But, but I shared with staff that we would absolutely look at it, but I couldn't make promises. Um, but as we look more and more about the, the lift to get teachers ready to, for synchronous, it might be something we have to, to look at and I would come to the board for, for approval on that. Um, and that's the end of my update. Board members, any questions? I just want to sure. make sure I understand. You're talking about one, one singular day, not one day a week or anything like that, right? For the, for the PD, for the asynchronous. That oh, yeah, one so singular day. So right. if, if and, the, and there are some districts in the community that when they shifted their K-5 and came back K-5 like we did, mm -hmm. they had um, one or two days of, of no kids in school so teachers could prepare. We did not do that at K-5. And really uh, the biggest focus was we didn't want to miss a beat with kids. Mm -hmm. And we also know with K-5 that creates a daycare scenario. And, we, and so, you know, uh, faculty was great. They asked, they, were, they would have loved that. But in terms of trying to find daycare, at, you know, sort of last minute and then, and then not want to skip a beat, we, we sort of went ahead. Um, you know, middle school opens up the door that maybe daycare isn't as much of an issue as it is in kindergarten through fifth grade. But we want to look at this and and that just that request just came now and i said i'd give it time to, to really look through but i do understand um because our k-5 teachers did not have to shift to synchronous teaching um and our bay trail teachers will have to do that um so and i just want to tell i mean it's teacher appreciation week so nothing like the superintendent coming over to a faculty meeting saying i appreciate you by the way um we're going to do something uh different um but kudos to our teachers they 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 had questions but 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 they're ready they get it i mean what their questions are which i understand i think any of us would is i've never done this before are you going to judge me on the second day where i'm trying to teach synchronous and there's a technology issue or i fumble with something and my stance is no and i think our community will support too that this is going to be a lift and we're going to give some grace to our teachers in the classroom to try synchronous and it's great data to have um, for the last five weeks of school as we look to next year and potentially having to do more synchronous for for a virtual program next year um, so so i think uh i think we're ready i think my focus as i talk to staff and i shared here tonight is the sel focus is important um, we got to get kids back. We've said that since September, this board's been unwavering on the commitment to get kids back. The guidance you have all read, you guys dig into it. It is, it is difficult to just do it, especially when the impact is on our taxpayers, when we can't meet the guidance and our insurance company says, we won't cover you if there's an issue. And, and that's big. And um, so, so we continue to not give up. You know, I, um, um, I, I think we'll be the only um, county school district using grade level as a cohort in middle school. Um, we're, but we're moving forward. We have uh, green light. And what's really interesting is, you know, we know that, that our local Department of Health does not approve our plan. They enforce it. So if we run into an issue, we run into an issue, we'll work through that. But again, the contact tracing um, definition for Monroe County is still six feet no mask 15 minutes so if we're three feet apart with masks we're still okay so but we'll monitor you know we'll monitor we'll work with our local department of health if there happens to be uh, a spike in student covid cases we will review we'll do our research and and make sure that we can say it's not a school-wide spread um, but we're going to be working through this process to try to get kids back in school and I've shared it as a parent and I've shared it as a superintendent and I know the board shares the same idea, which is getting harder and harder when things are opening outside, when kids are playing sports, when you drive by a park and everybody's out. And, and it's easy to say, well, we don't control any of that, but it's still what's happening. And I think the vaccination rates continue to go up and we're learning more and more and the weather's nice, we can open windows. And so we're gonna keep pushing in this district to get kids back. So, so I'm not done. And I know you're not done pushing for high school. That is going to be hard to do, um, but, but we're gonna continue looking on what we can do. But right now it's K-5 is back. Two weeks later, we're pushing to get um, our, our middle school back. 
Um, the easy thing to do would just say cohort, I can't do it. And um, instead we're saying, well, where's the definition of cohort? What does that look like? Can we define cohort? And, and we've got a plan to say it is a cohort. It's the entire sixth grade, the entire seventh grade, the entire eighth grade. Those are our three cohorts and it allows us an opportunity to get kids back into school. Mark? Yes, um, Catherine. You may, okay. So Tom, because yeah. you just made that explanation, you brought up something that I would like to comment on. A couple of things is that we have really worked with that consistency piece about consistently wanting to get kids back to school. But that flexibility piece has always been the difficulty. And I, um, I, I applaud all the efforts of everybody who worked on this, but especially the teachers, since it is Teacher Appreciation Week, I yeah. want to say so, their flexibility as well um is is amazing and it's appreciated and then the other thing i wanted to say is they i i don't know if it's official but they've been talking about uh vaccinating children at 12 years and older and it, i don't know if that's the way it is now or if they're still it's just, coming Next it's week, coming is what they say but that should really help overall yeah. you know uh is more and more uh, you know if people go for it and they decide to do it uh that certainly will um with will help with people's what is it called the risk comfort the risk level? tolerance yeah the risk tolerance yep. so that should help yeah I, I think i'm glad you bring that up because i think that the the vaccination piece is is interesting right so we know that that it is not a requirement and right. to be fair i we do not see it being a requirement for next year um, um i don't uh you know the flu vaccination is not a requirement uh, there are some we know and we dealt with in this this board and district advocated and tried to work through but when the state made a law about needing vaccinations in order to attend school um, although there was a lot of advocacy um, the state did what they did mm -hmm. right and so right. that's part of being little government we we have to follow those rules right um, dr. Driff will talk tonight about you know state funding well it's great what we can do with it but when it goes away because we're not following the rules that 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 doesn't help our taxpayers so, um, you know, so, but I, but I want to be fair too, is that um, uh, you, you have seen my emails and whenever we have a vaccination event or something like that, I will share it on behalf of our community to mm -hmm. say this is an opportunity. Um, but you won't see me, um, you won't see me tweeting uh, that I got my vaccination. It's just, it's just my philosophy, which is I will give information, right. but then it's up to the parents and the community to decide what they want to do with it. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of different reasons uh, for that. So mm -hmm. I do think though that as more, that's what they continue to say, as more people get vaccinated, that allows us to open up more things. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's great. Um, but I also know it's such a tough decision for for families and parents, and, oh, I, and I know for a fact you're you you and I have had these great conversations yeah. about it because it's there's a lot there, right? And that's where I see, and I know the board agrees, is like is what the what is the role of a school district is to educate, and so it's also to educate and say here are opportunities for the vaccination as it comes out, but not to say this is what you have to do. Exactly. And, and my point in bringing it up is that that's another piece of the whole big picture, yeah. which could make a difference as far as people's comfort level and the success of, uh, you know, going forward. But I, you, well, as you know, yeah. it is a per, I agree, it's a personal decision, but that opportunity being there, I think is helpful. I think that helped greatly for people who, you know, who feel concerned but feel safer with the vaccination, and it does open up the door to, to allow us to get back quicker. And, and, you know, I've said it before, I was asked um, at, a, at a teacher meeting, not, not this most recent one, like, well, what about September? So I've been like really clear, like we're opening in September, we will find a way. And remember, we got this guidance about reopening in July. We had to create a plan by July 30th. Then we had to make that plan and you know so we had like four weeks in the summer to do this and it was in the midst of nobody knows anything about covid pandemic time and we've learned so much about it we know much more i think even the people who are i can't speak for i'll speak for me even concerned that i was in august my concern is different now i feel more knowledgeable about it i feel like we know how to put things in place to be safe and so as we know those things we're more and more comfortable to say, what can we do to make sure and guarantee that we're, we're back in? 
And so that's, I mean, that's, uh, 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 that to me is we will figure it out. Our advisory committees know they've all got the marching orders from me that that is what they're coming back with. They're coming back with a plan to come back full time in September. And if somebody needs virtual, we will make sure that we have the best virtual program we can offer. And what does that look like? I don't know yet, but we've learned a lot this year, but we do think we have one of the lowest virtual rates in the county. We, I think more, I think we're gonna have a large percent coming back next year, but we'll still offer that virtual program. Mm -hmm. So that's, thanks for coming to my TED talk. I don't know, that's, that's all I got. I'm, I'm frustrated, I'm exhausted, but I give kudos to, to our teachers and our administrators and the board for just not giving up. It would be the easy thing to do and you guys have pushed nonstop, so thank you. Board members? Thank you, Tom. You're welcome. That concludes superintendent reports. Great, thank you. Next up are change orders. It's recommended that the board approve the following change orders that you see on your agenda. May I have a motion and a second to, let me get down here, uh, to approve the change orders that described above so moved second any questions or comments mm. all those in favor <laughs> any opposed motion carries and policies for first read we have one policy for first read 7230 dual credit for college students would someone like to speak to that I would love to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this you. was really just a cleanup. Yeah. <laughs> no. This is a cleanup of a policy. So it's just really the language was a bit confusing. It's up online. You can look at it. But at the high school, we do offer mm -hmm. some dual credit opportunities, both in person through our Syracuse University uh, Project Advanced classes, through Project Lead the Way, uh, through MCC. So we offer that sort of what I think people look at as dual credit, because it's a college course you're taking in high school. We also offer, typically to seniors, um, that students could take classes non non-matriculated at area colleges. The biggest one we see, uh, we work with the most is MCC. So a senior can attend MCC classes and as long as they're approved in advance by their counselor that they fit the New York State requirement, then we would use those credits for uh, their high school diploma. Mm -hmm. And so it's a partnership we've had for many, many years. We have had students do the same thing at U University of Rochester and RIT, but typically it's MCC. The, the cost for that is, is, is on the student or the student's family. Um, but for some students it works really well because they really are um, passionate about something or because they would rather not be in high school and finish up at MCC their last semester because that's where they're gonna end up going to school. So we just cleaned up the wording to make it read what we actually do. So there's no real change to the policy, um, but it's online, you can take a look at it. But that's my plug too to, to what that high school does in order mm -hmm. to support students of all different levels. Uh, a lot of our students, um, uh, ha uh, there are students who use it every year and it's been really cool. Board members, any questions or comments? Mm -hmm. All right, and we will uh, revisit that for a second read at our next meeting, which we'll vote on it. And then next is the Monroe County School Board Association meetings. There was a labor relations meeting. Mm -hmm. That was. Yes, there was. And um, it was last Wednesday, and I was in attendance. Um, it was the last one for this year, and the presentation was evaluating staff in a virtual environment. Mm -hmm. um, it was very uh, well done. Um, it was from the Rush Henrietta. Um, Patrick McHugh, who's the assistant superintendent of, H of HR and school accountability, and Dominic uh, Passantini, uh, Passantini, well, he's the director of professional learning and program evaluation, um, and they did an excellent, excellent job. Um, they covered the, what their guiding principles were. Um, they used, um, they referenced the book, You Don't Have to Be Bad to Get Better by Candy McKay, um, noting that the observation process should be about professional growth and reflection to create improvements in instruction, student learning, and achievement. Um, and the emphasis was on clear expectations and rubrics is key to the process. Um, 
Pat also told us that uh, there were reported multiple changes to APPR, noting that two components remained, um, which were student performance and classroom observations. Of course, spring three, to eight, three through eight tests were canceled and 2019-20 evaluations were waived. So without guidance from SED for this year, um, and including they still don't have guidance, um, districts continue to focus on instructional supervision, remote teaching, and school slash district improvement goals. Um, districts are trying to balance pressure and support to account for the social, emotional needs of students and staff. And they also want to give staff um, the, the space to experiment and develop the remote instructional skills. One thing um, that's not noted here in the um, notes is that he said it was agreed upon that their technology skills were never part of their um, um, evaluation. And I thought that was fair, very fair. And um, um, certainly I would have had multiple issues with the um, <laughs> yeah. technology stuff. Um, you know, the contract considerations, there were memorandums of agreement to govern the teacher contractual terms and working conditions. Um, local teacher unions were very accommodating with changes and other contractual issues occurred um, for sports and extracurricular activities when, when they were brought back last spring. Um, I'm just trying to see what else. The, the next steps were that um, districts plan to pursue program evaluation of remote learning and work to deepen teachers' understanding and use of best practices in the online environment. They also plan to strengthen leaders' use of remote framework and the quality of observation feedback. He and, um, Pat said that the district's experience with online learning would inform the implementation and integration of the state's new technology standards and the district also plans to expand student opportunities for online classes, which I, of course, asked a question about <laughs> in terms of, so that in doing all of this online things, do you foresee um, school districts collaborating together for those very tough classes that you can't find the teachers, and there's Barb shaking her head, um, that the teachers aren't there, like Russian or um, Italian, and. German and all that, and um, Pat and um, said that already BOCES is developing mm. some sort of um, uh, way to do that. So that's an exciting piece because I know that in the past we've struggled with, you know, we've students that want to do things, but we don't have enough to fill mm -hmm. the need for a teacher. Right. So that this is an exciting thing that has come from. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm you know, uh, a negative, but yet we see seeing it as a positive. Yeah. So um, the Jetsons are coming to reality. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so that was our last meeting. Um, they, they asked for ideas for topics for next year. So if I'm putting it out there for um, the board to come up with um, ideas for labor relations. Yeah. Um, I did put in that I'd like to see um, an update because two years ago we did have a presentation on um, how um, some of the school districts are looking elsewhere to um, for uh, new employees mm -hmm. um, and I, I thought we, it was time to do an update and see how, how we're doing with that mm -hmm. so there you go any questions all right any questions thank you I know we have a legislative committee coming up tomorrow mm -hmm. our last one for the year last one for the year mm -hmm. And uh, you all should have received the notice of annual meeting for the Monroe County School Board Association. It just came in. Mm -hmm. If you haven't seen it, it came in this afternoon mm -hmm. for May 26th. So I hope we can all attend. I think this will be uh, a good year to celebrate the end of the year at <laughs> that event. <laughs> With that, is there, there's no unfinished business. Is there any new business? May I have a motion and a second that the meeting be adjourned at 8.04 p.m. So moved. Second. Any questions or comments? All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion adjourned.
meeting adjourned